Hi, everyone. I'm Bill Squadron, president of our energy policy. And thank you for joining us today for our webinar that will be addressing the challenges, the policy, the critical issue of how we work together through this energy transition to be sure that we have a just, equitable, and inclusive approach to this very, very important um, initiative that everyone is really engaged in right now and is going to be occupying so much effort over the next decades. We're very fortunate to have um, an excellent panel to discuss this issue. Um, and we are very grateful to our co-host Shell and to all of our partners for our energy policies, programs and webinars and live events. We really thank all of them for their support um, we, of course, are very grateful to all of you for joining us today for this webinar, um, and we're going to get to it in just a minute. But actually, to kick it off, um, we're going to have a short clip from a video on this specific topic as part of the Rational Middle Energy Series. Um, now, before I um, introduce the video, I do want to remind everyone um, that toward the end of the hour of discussion, we will have questions from the audience. So... For any of you that have questions for our panel, please type them in the chat box and we will get to as many of the questions as we possibly can. But now to, to start things off from the Rational Middle Energy Series, we are gonna see a short video clip addressing this critical issue that we're talking about today. Reaching net zero is critically important. We need to ensure that we're talking about approaching it in a way that is equitable and just then there cannot be winners and losers in this equation. With climate change, we're already starting to see the impacts firsthand. Extreme weather events, higher temperatures, flooding, coastal erosion, sea level rise. And of course, our most vulnerable communities, communities of color, lower wealth white communities, and indigenous populations are the ones who are hit first and worst. These communities are vulnerable to you know, air pollution and to the health impacts that that causes. We definitely see that in the South and Southeast, but you know, also in, in other places in the Appalachian regions as well. These areas traditionally are the last to receive resources and also the first to have, you know, at times, irrecoverable impact. And these communities, if we don't begin to make real change happen, if we don't begin to lower the emissions and hopefully one day be able to eliminate the emissions, they are going to continue to not only be in the sacrifice zones, but they're going to be the sacrifice people based upon the policy decisions that we've made. So it makes sense for us to address the climate crisis, because when we make these investments now, we are strengthening these communities that have often been sacrificed. Thank you. And that really leads into the important discussion that we have today. I'm gonna to welcome our panel, and we are very fortunate to have as our moderator, Gregory Kallenberg, who was director and producer of the Rational Middle Energy Series, um, a very highly decorated writer, director, producer, um, the director and producer of Haynesville, a nation's hunt for an energy future, formerly story editor, director, writer for um, the award-winning Bluefield Productions. So I'm going to turn it over to Gregory for this conversation. We're delighted to have you here, Gregory, and thank you very much. Uh, Bill, it is phenomenal to be here. Um, I uh, appreciate the kind words and, and showing the video. Um, of course, you can go see the full-length video at uh, rationmiddle.com. Um, again, my name is Gregory Kallenberg. I'm the founder of the Ration Middle, which is a, it's a documentary company from over been around for over a decade and our focus is creating the ability for people to see balanced films and for them to have those difficult discussions which is one of the ones we're going to have today but also come up with civil solutions based you know solutions that actually create a venue for people to come together and talk about compromise which is for better and worse the way that a lot of these complicated issues get resolved I cannot think um, of a more important issue than the one we're going dis to discuss today, and I cannot think of a better panel to be with us today. I have had the honor of hanging out with both of these people um, at South by Southwest. 
I've filmed both of them as part of the video series, and I am thrilled to have them here today. Um, I'd love for them to introduce themselves just because, again, they are phenomenal people, and um, I would love for you to meet them. And you will right now. Please give a warm virtual round of applause to two amazing people, Gretchen Watkins and Paula Glover. Gretchen and Paula, welcome to the virtual stage. Thank you. Thank you. Um, why, why don't we start um, with you guys introducing yourselves and just know that any gaps I will fill in if you're modest about it. Paula, why don't, why don't we start with okay. you? <laughs> These are virtual, so I'm looking back and forth in the camera. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us at lunchtime for this conversation. My name is Paula Glover. I am the president of the Alliance of Save Energy, um, where we say energy efficiency is first for any kind of trust um, transition, but in particularly um, a just transition. I have spent 30 plus years working in energy um, and thinking and working um, about the relationship that different communities have with our energy system, um, some more unjust than others, and what are the kinds of policies that we need to make the kinds of changes that we want to have. Great. Thank you, Paula. Gretchen? Yeah, my name is Gretchen Watkins. I am the president of Shell USA, and it's great to be here with you, Gregory, and you, Paula. Um, I've also spent my career in energy and maybe a little bit of, of a different side of, of energy than Paula, but uh, 30 plus years as well. Uh, I joined Shell about five years ago. And uh, frankly, I'm just really feeling very privileged to be part of this conversation because if we're going to do um, the energy transition in a way that brings everybody forward, um, talking about how we do that in a just and equitable way is just so important. So really feel uh, grateful to be here today. Well, um, I, it is, again, wonderful to have you guys here. And I'm, I, I think, Gretchen, with you sort of leading us into a, an easy first question, um, let's frame up the issue. Um, what does an inclusive and just energy transformation mean to you? Gretchen, I mean, you know, coming from the corporate side, but also I know that there's a lot of sort of personal sort of interest in this issue also. Yeah, I think I think for sure there is no playbook for how to do this. And so when we think about it at Shell, when I think about it personally, I think very much about it being um, an, a, a lesson in learning. So how do we learn from each other as we're going through this transition, which means doing a lot of listening. Um, it means doing a lot of trying things out and seeing how they work. Um, it means getting really, really close to the communities where we live and work, the communities that we serve by providing different forms of energy and listening to them about the importance and um, what, what is meaningful to them when they think about secure supply, reliable supply, affordable supply. Um, and so I, I think that's, that's all part of it. And we've started to, you know, through that learning and listening, we've, we've started to really take action on some of this stuff. Um, certainly for a long time, we've been in action on being very close to the communities where we live and work. But I think we've also really started pushing the accelerator down on things like supplier diversity um, and, and other ways that we can impact the community. Um, and so that's, that's, that's where I would start the conversation. I love that. And, you know, Paula, you know, of course, this is a, a deep pool for you that you swim around in on a daily basis. What does that equitable energy transformation mean to you? Yeah, I think it, it, it looks very much as Gretchen has described. It is a transition that really does include everybody. Um, and we talk a lot about not leaving communities behind. Um, but address transition, I think, means is how do you engage communities in a way that they fully receive the benefits of this transition, whether that is small business benefits, economic growth, it's obviously right, cleaner air and less pollution, um, but it's also how do we make sure that people have the right kinds of access to adopt whatever measures that these communities want to have. And, and as an industry, we have to figure out how do we build the right kind of infrastructure um, to support that kind of transition um, knowing that in centering the idea that communities get to make the choice, 
we don't get to make the choice, but they get to make the choice. And so listening and really understanding where people are becomes critically important. Um, but I would just add, because we are in a climate crisis, I don't know that we can do this any other way. Um, I don't know that we can truly address climate change if we are going to not address equity. Those two things um, just have to go together because you know it's not going to be one community in one state that has clean air and then the community next door to it isn't going to suffer from climate. That's actually not what's going to happen. And so um, we're at a period of time where it's just a mandatory for us all to do. But I think we also have share a lot of enthusiasm about doing this work the right way. You know, I think it's fascinating. Like I said, I've, I've been doing energy documentaries for over a decade, and there is this heightened awareness that I want to say is in the maybe the past three to six years um, yeah. that has sort of added sort of the just transition into the energy transformation. I'm I'm curious how in both of your worlds, how has that affected the discussion about the energy transformation, right? And also the trajectory, right? I, I think that one of the things that you mentioned, Paula, that is super interesting is how complicated it gets so quickly when you think about energy transformation and adjust energy transformation, right? Um, so I'm I'm just curious about that not only that heightened awareness, but how that's affected the discussions in your particular world. Gretchen, you want to take? Yeah, this I mean, I, I just to to build on, um, you know, what Paula was saying. You know, we we've come to think of it as we can have conversations about diversity, equity, and inclusion without talking about the energy transition, but we can't have conversations about the energy transition without talking about equity. Um, and I think that's just they the two go hand in hand, and so. We like to think about it, um, again, in terms of what types of products are we able to offer our customers from an affordability standpoint, a low emission standpoint, how are we relating to the communities where we live and work? Um, but also, I think it's important to note that all sorts of other external factors are coming into play as we're going through this. And so, you know, whether it's frankly, geopolitics um, and how that impacts affordability for everybody, uh, whether it's the, um, the policies that are being passed by the government and how those help um, or hinder. And I think it's also just thinking about energy as something that can really enhance the human experience. And so why wouldn't we want that accessibility to clean and affordable energy um, for everybody? Because it really is about a standard of living. It enhances the standard and the quality of living. And energy po poverty is a reality. And so addressing energy poverty while we're going through this transition, I think is just a, a, an imperative. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think I would expand just to say, I think the thing we're learning is how all of these things are so connected. And so it's not just about energy policy, but as um, you know, Gretchen alluded to, it's a little bit about national security policy. Um, it is about our supply chain. Um, it is about workforce um, and all and, and public education and all those things that feed into us having a really strong workforce. Um, it's about affordable housing. I um, mean, we have a housing crisis. Like all of these things are happening at the same time. And I think I'm enthusiastic because we all see the role that we can play in this, um, whether you're in specifically the energy sector or not. We actually all have a role that we can play in this transition and we're all wholly involved because we can all benefit. Um, and so I think that that's the thing that's really different about this moment, um, that we came out of a pandemic together and that the world was kind of open to us and we're in all of these crises together at home, watching it, you know, then things are opening up and we are transitioning, um, but we are so much more hyper aware about all the things that are going on around us and that are going on in other communities, I would suggest because we were locked down for a while um, and that did force us in some way to kind of pay attention to all the other things that were going on in the world. So, so Paula, you know, you say that you're enthusiastic, but you tied a, a pretty uh, awesome Gordian knot uh, with uh, <laughs> between the two of you guys. You have geopolitics in there. You have policies, energy, poverty, national security, workforce development, supply chain, affordable housing, right? I mean, it's, I'm trying to think what else is there, which is, you know, I'm sure that there are other factors. Public that health. How, what's that? Public health. Yeah. Well, and, and public health, right. Yeah. And so 
thinking about those things and about that sort of trajectory and that timeline, do you, do you find now knowing like all those externalities has sort of um, helped sort of get us on the right track or has it slowed us down or is it, can we find goals that are out there that are common between us? You know, I think those externalities have gotten us to be a little bit more creative and, and thoughtful at the same time. Um, and so what I mean by that is for me, I advocate for energy efficiency policy. I believe that if we decarbonize our buildings and start with that, we'll get a long way towards this transition we want. And I believe that that, right, the improvement of our buildings and our housing stock has a lot to do with the improvement of our public health, the lowering of asthma, like all kinds of societal greater benefits. Um, but to be able to do that, I also have to um, understand what are the challenges about having high, access to high-speed internet um, in various communities, because we need that for to decarbonize my buildings. Um, but I also we also need it for public education, for better public education. And so I think that what I use as an example to say that this has allowed us to create different types of alliances and partnerships and allowing us to see how we are connected in ways that we had not expected. Um, an example I like to use is really around the, the relationship between workforce and public education. Um, and so we have wonderful policies and investments in workforce development, but we also have an a gap with students who have been um, were doing COVID learning. And so those are our work, that's our workforce 10 years from now. And so as business leaders, we actually do have to care about what's going on with today's four, you know, fourth and fifth graders because they are our future employees, as well as understanding how we need the workforce now. So training of returning citizens, understanding if we need better immigration policy, like all this other stuff has to happen at the same time. Um, and so my optimism is that the coalition has to be broad because we're looking at the same problem from different lenses, um, but we are looking at the same problem from different lenses, if that makes sense. And, and, and you know, and I, I, I love, you know, again, what, what we almost did was make the Gordy knot a little bit bigger and a little- I love bit making it bigger. I'm, I, well, but that's good though. I mean, it's good to know what's out there and what needs to be taken care of. Uh, Gretchen, from a corporate standpoint, you know, when you look at all these things and you truly have to look at it from a global perspective, do you feel like the trajectory is, are you enthusiastic about the track that we're on or the, the changes that we need to make to make sure that it's a energy transformation and it's equitable? Yeah, I think, I think what is happening is that um, we're actually forging new alliances that we haven't forged before. And so when you look at the um, organizations that we've come together with over, um, you know, over a tackling energy transition problems, um, they're not maybe the traditional organizations you might think a company like Shell would partner with. So, for example, the National Coastal Resilience Fund is something that we've supported um, for the last number of years, and that fund is really aimed at um, not just repairing. Um, coastal resilient or, or in repairing where coastal um, environments need repair, but also ensuring that as the weather changes, that we're enforcing those areas and protecting those areas. And so we're working very closely with um, both state and federal governments on protecting the coasts. Another example is right here in our U.S. Um, hometown of Houston, Texas where we have, we're one of, Houston's one of a hundred cities as part of the 100 Resilient Cities Fund. And we have um, supported the hiring of a chief resilience officer for the city of Houston. Um, and that chief resilience officer is looking at things like, how can this city be ready for um, a Hurricane Harvey that came through about six years ago and be able to respond um, in a more resilient way, be more prepared, have citizens living here and communities living here that are more prepared. Um, and so I think, and, and another thing that we're doing along those lines is we've actually installed solar power generators in various communities for community centers so that if all the power goes out, there's actually a place people can go that will have reliable power. So we're looking at ways to partner um, at the state, federal, local community levels um, on things like that, that resiliency. And so, uh, you know, I am, I'm, you know, Gretchen, you did a great job. You're, you're, you're going to be, you're going to be my segue maker today because you've done <laughs> such a wonderful job 
helping us, you know, join the questions. You know, you talked a lot about what you guys, uh, as Shell is doing, and uh, Paula, you mentioned um, government policy, which is super interesting because one of the things I've learned, you know, being a young pup in this industry and, and getting to learn more about the energy system and the way it works, can you guys talk about kind of the challenges and opportunities that exist not only for business, but also for government going forward and what that role of government is as we move into a just and equitable energy transformation? Yeah, I'll, I'll start a little bit, Gretchen. Um, you know, over the last three years, the Biden administration, we've seen, what, trillions of dollars in different types of investment, whether that's workforce, grid resiliency, um, efficiency programming, um, green banks funding, all kinds of things, right, to help with with this transition. And the administration has clearly made equity a priority. Um, and so that's like another marker that really gets us all to start to think about um, creatively what we need to do. But those policies do send signals about priorities, priorities of the kinds of projects that they want to fund, um, certainly priorities about, you know, having a focus on disadvantaged communities in ways that we have not had before, whether that's through Justice 40 um, or through the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. And so policy sees, it is, has created this opportunity for transition, um, but it also sees the challenges. And I think, you know, certainly for organizations like the Alliance and others of us, our responsibility is to re pay attention so that today we have all this money that is going to be let out into the market for various programs and initiatives we want to make sure that it's spent and that the outcomes are reflective of what we think they're going to be when the policies were enacted. Um, and so it is important to not just get the first win and walk away and say, well, you know, there's all this money that's going to be spent for this and we have solar for all. And we're going to have hydrogen hubs. And, and so we're done with it. Um, we're not done with it. We're actually just getting started. And so it is now right that organizations and companies um, those who are getting federal funds and have put in either applications for grants or receiving grants really have to think about, okay, does my community benefit plan, is it going to have the results that I've promised? And if I start to see that it doesn't, how do I pivot? Because no one wants to be on the other end of that story if the money is not spent well or the outcome is not what we intended. Um, and so that is the role that policy um, can play. Um, and interestingly enough, I think it also sets it up so that other partners can join and participate in that, right? Like there, there has to be the realization that government money is not going to pay for this transition. That, that it, just, it just can't. And so it is important to have public-private partnerships. It is important to build the capacity of your nonprofit organizations. It is important to be really diligent about how things are spent and to make sure that the outcomes are reflected of what you had intended um, so that if they aren't, you can pivot way before the end date. All of those things um, play a really important role, um, but government certainly sends the signal as to what its priorities are gonna be um, so that we can also engage at that way, that level. So, so, so Gretchen, I'm going to tell you that Paula is now stealing your mantle as a segue um, <laughs> person to get the segue award because you know it's a great, it's a great lead in to the same question to you, knowing that government isn't going to solve this crisis. It has to be that public-private partnership. How do you feel about that, and what are some of the things that you guys are tackling that might move us down the road? Yeah, I think it is absolutely imperative, and I would I would start by saying we're really um, pleased and encouraged to see some of the legislation that's come out of the IRA um, that really allows us uh, to look at investments in things like carbon capture and hydrogen and low carbon fuels um, and have a, um, an economic incentive that it helps with those investments, helps speed them up, helps them have more longevity. Uh, and, and so that's been great. I think Paula also mentioned the grants coming out of the infrastructure bill, the IIJA. We're actively participating in that too, which is really establishes a partnership um, between business and, and uh, government, unlike anything we've seen before in the space. Um, I would also say that we continue to really um, be true to that listening mode that we're in. Um, I think we believe at Shell that companies like Shell that are, um, you know, that have a lot of scale, that can bring money to the table, that understand how big projects can get built, 
but also have experience working in, in communities, we're not perfect and we're not gonna get it right every single time, but I do, I can tell you that our ears are wide open and that learning mode is something that we're very committed to. And so I think um, that's really how I would, I would look at that partnership coming together being, being very important. And maybe last thing I would say, Gregory, is that we believe we can bring a lot of different energy sources to the table that enable that affordability um, and security, that reliability to happen. And that includes things like hydrocarbons, but it also includes things like solar and wind and low carbon fuels. And it also includes looking at our own operations and how we can make those more efficient and have those emissions decline. So um, that, that's, that's the whole, it's a, we can bring like a very large universe of energy to the table. Um, and that's, that's what we're trying to do. So, so, so Gretchen, just, just to kind of um, take us down just maybe one level, is, is there a specific sort of um, opportunity or challenge or endeavor that you guys have taken on where it's a good example of the utilization of help from the government or as Paula says, the signals, and then some of the things that you guys are doing innovation-wise or partnership-wise out there in the real world? Yeah, I mean, I can tell you that we've we've got a number of what, renewable natural gas um, businesses around the country in the United States, and renewable natural gas actually is created from um, you know farm waste, and it's it's the similar sort of natural gas that comes out of um, you know big landfills or um, you know piles of manure <laughs> um, or piles of, of organic material that's basically degrading, um, it produces methane and, and we capture that methane and we are able to sell it. And because it comes, it doesn't come from hydrocarbons, um, it comes from a natural source like that, um, it, is a, it is a renewable source of energy. And so we're able to take the clean energy credits that have been, that are part of the IRA legislation that's been passed um, and enable us to actually invest more in those renewable natural gas businesses than we would have been able to otherwise. So that's something that's happening as we speak. And I would say there's more um, investments that we're looking at right now that will be future, but are enabled by that um, Inflation Reduction Act uh, uh, carbon credit scheme or a clean energy credit scheme. I love that. There, there's really no sexy way to put manure into- <laughs> I know, um, sorry. Gas, <laughs> I but, had to go there. <laughs> but it is what it is. It is, it is. And, it, and, you know, again, when you think about those things that are out there, like that kind of waste being turned into energy, that's super exciting. Um, I do want to remind our audience, um, as Bill said before, um, please tap those questions into the chat box. Um, I know that uh, Jordan will be joining us soon to uh, ask those questions of you guys from the audience. Um, but moving on, I'm I'm curious about um, national and state policies that you guys might be seeing out there that really are innovative and in taking us towards a just and equitable energy transformation. And um, Paula, you know, you just in our pre-call, you talked about some of the things that you had heard, whether they were happening in California or over on the East Coast, that really do affect affordability, but also bring people into that energy transformation along with everybody else. Could, could you talk about those a bit? Yeah, sure. I think there are several that really, I think, highlighted. The first really is the president's executive order around Justice 40 um, and this idea that 40 percent of the benefits have to go to particular communities that have been impacted by environmental justice. Um, that's a big deal. That that really, I think, should not underestimate that level of spend and commitment to those particular communities and the fact that they have been highlighted. But in addition to that, right, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund um, also, which comes through the EPA, also has a Justice 40 component where 40% of the investment of those monies that are invested have to be invested in those particular communities. That really, those kinds of things are a big style, a big deal. Um, you know, states that are thinking about different types of rate structures to make energy more affordable for consumers, 
Um, we have policies now that for energy efficient appliances, where you may be able to get a rebate previously is now a point of service rebate. So as opposed to a customer buying the appliance or the equipment, um, then sending in a card to the utility company or whomever is going to give them the rebate. Now there's opportunity for particular customers, certainly low moderate income customers. If you need an HVAC system, you can go to Home Depot and the rebate is at the point of service. So now it's just the $7,500 off, eight that, whatever that is off. All of those kinds of policies are big deals for consumers. Um, but what I would challenge us to think about is how do we fill in the gap? We have great policies for low-income consumers, LIHEAP, which is a low-income energy assistant program, um, weatherization. But those are for customers who are living at 200% of the poverty line, if that and typically, many of those customers, those customers, the number of those customers outnumber the amount of dollars that can be spent. Um, and so as we're thinking about a transition um, that I think should center on buildings and our homes and health and all these other things we want, we have to figure out how do you make those investments for co customers who sit in the gap, um, who I have a hole in my roof um, and I don't qualify for anything, but I still have a hole, hole in my roof. Um, like that problem did not go away. And so for us at the Alliance, and in, in, in terms of policy, we're starting to think about what is required to fill in the gap. Is that a policy thing or is that a programmatic thing? Or is there a way for us to stack resources together to fix these kinds of problems? But I think that's really where we are now is that we have to figure out where the gaps lie and how do we address those gaps for customers um, who may not be really low income, but who still need a lot of help. So, 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 Gretchen, on the uh, state and federal level, I mean, are you seeing policies? I mean, of course, the IRA is one that sort of stands out that that is is a has been sort of bellwether of sorts. But are you seeing sort of the federal and state policies out there, or are there innovative ideas on policies or programs that should be created to help transition us to the energy future and do it in an equ equitable way? I think the the Inflation Reduction Act is a giant step forward. And so we very much see that as enabling increased investment into things like carbon capture and sequestration, um, hydrogen production, um, and uh, low carbon fuels, renewable fuels, biofuels. Um, so I think all of that is really good. I would say some of the things that some of the other pieces to the puzzle that could be helpful would be um, all of that is in incenting um, supply creation. Um, having an equal incentive for demand uh, also would be helpful. We're finding that um, while we can produce all of these different types of low carbon and no carbon, no emissions fuels, um, the cost of them doesn't compete all the time with traditional hydrocarbon fuels. And so when you've got a cost difference and you don't have an incentive to spend more, um, then, then it's hard to see the demand going up. Um, now, that's a something that over time, we very much believe technology is going to get better. Prices are going to come down. We've seen it happen with solar um, and, and wind. And so over time, we think that's going to happen. But Right now, um, I think the IRA is going to speed up investment. Um, we'd also like to be see an equal speed up of of the demand for those new um, those new energy sources. Well, and, and let's stick with you, uh, Gretchen, uh, on this next one because really I, I want to jump over to the business side because you know again as Paula said, you know, government's not going to save us all here. It really does take, a, a, you know, the pub public side and the private side. Um, what are some of the things that, as a business, you're seeing out there that is going to help sort of transition us to an equi equitable uh, uh, energy transformation in the future? Yeah, I, I would offer a couple of, of examples. I think probably the most impactful thing that we're doing right now is really um, engaging around supplier diversity. And that may sound like a very easy thing to do. <laughs> um, we'll just go out and find a supplier that's owned by um, a woman or a person of color and we'll em you know, employ them, sign a contract with them. Um, the fact of the matter is uh, there aren't, unfortunately, many of those out there. Um, and quite often we wind up looking for a person with a good idea that just needs 
um, just needs to sign that first contract. And a good, good example of that is a company we've been working with now for about, I think, 15 years or so called Jackson Offshore. So we met Lee Jackson. Uh, he had been a worker um, working in the offshore Gulf of Mexico. He had an idea. I want to buy a, a boat and become a, um, a supply boat uh, worker for the offshore oil and gas business. Um, he, he needed a loan though. And so Shell stepped in and said, look, we want to support you. So we gave him a low interest loan. We signed his first contract. Like I said, this was 12, 15 years ago. He now has a fleet of, I think, nine or 10 uh, vessels that he operates um, a very competitive um, business where he supplies services to the offshore industry. And he's got, um, a, we've re-signed multiple contracts with him, but he's got contracts with a lot of other um, companies also that, that work in and around the, the Gulf Coast. And so again, that's a, a, a great example of um, A, uh, a, a real success story there, but B, this can't be something we do in a year. Like this year, we're going to focus on supplier diversity and next year we'll focus on something else. It's a real marathon in terms of building relationships, um, helping people set up a business. Um, we've even started in Louisiana holding workshops for women and minority owned businesses where they come, we've, we hold sort of a 12 week workshop and, and they come with their ideas and we help them uh, set up a P&L. We help them, here's how you need to apply to be um, a, an approved supplier for a company like Shell, which isn't always easy. Um, and so we're really working um, in the communities in particular where our staff live and work, um, where our operations have a direct impact on the community um, and, and making that part of a real effort to, to be a positive influence as we move through this, this transition. So, so, so Paula, does that resonate with you? I know that you have a lot of exposure to people on the ground, um, that the people who are out there and you apparently, I've already detailed that it has to be a private public partnership for us to be transitioning to that 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 energy future. Uh, Gretchen talked not only about sort of lifting up some of these uh, vendors that are out there, but also workforce development, which, which I know is something that is really important to this transition. Does does what Gretchen say sort of lead you to be sort of um, in a place where where cor corporate America is doing the right thing, moving us forward? Yeah, I think that's an easy, absolutely. Um, because I think what Gretchen is talking about is actually more than just supplier diversity. She's talking about creating wealth. And that's a different kind of animal when you start talking about disadvantaged communities, underrepresented, just poor communities, people who are impoverished. The ability to create wealth, which is far greater than to have a great paying job, um, but to actually create wealth is a really, really big deal. And we do need companies to do what Gretchen and Shell are doing, which is to make investments in companies. Um, what we know um, is that minority-owned companies have a really difficult time raising capital, particularly those who are raised um, that are run by Black women. That's just a fact. Um, and so anytime um, a, a company can make that kind of investment in this early stage business who has an idea and then provide them all the other supports, because it's not just about the money. It is about what is a PL and how what does a statement need to look like? How do you navigate our process in terms of getting into the vendor system? All of that um, are the kinds of challenges that small business owners really suffer from. They really can get jammed up and not be able to participate and quite frankly, give up. Um, and it does then feel like this is an industry that does not want me because they want me to show up in a way that is virtually impossible um, if I've had no experience with you before. And so um, I'm saying like four exclamation points to what Gretchen is talking about um, because I believe personally that wealth creation is as important, if not more than important, more important than just creating great paying jobs. And uh, by the way, Gretchen, that was four exclamation points. Four. Yeah. Four hey, exclamation I'll, I'll points. I'll take too. all four of them, Gregory. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, That's right. Paula. Um, and, I, <laughs> and I know I know that um, that Jordan is going to come and uh, uh, join us again if you're out there uh, uh, and interested in asking a question to these amazing panelists. Just jump on your uh, Zoom text box machine and um, and do the magical uh, typing thing. Um, as a result, 
and I know that my time is sort of coming to an end and we're going to leave it to the hive mind, um, which are wonderful people too. Um, I, I'd like to, I'd like to ask you guys kind of a, a you know, the, the question that hopefully everyone can take and put into their pocket as they walk out of here and, um, and back into a life where they are trying to create the energy transition. Um, I'm curious about two things, you know, because again, I have a lot of stuff written down on my pad that is that are issues that have to get resolved for us to be on track or continue to be on track for the energy transition. Um, both of you guys are in worlds that you have to sort of activate and energize, pun intended, um, to uh, make those people track towards that energy, clean energy future. I am curious if ultimately you are optimistic about what the energy future could be. And again, an equitable energy future is, you know, important. It's not even what this is about. It's what everything has to be about. Mm -hmm. um, and how do we stay on track? Really those marching orders for those people who are out there that come to the, our energy policy webinars and really have real influence and ability to do things out there. So first question being sort of, are you optimistic? And second question, part the second part of the question is really okay. You're optimistic, but what can we do to stay on track and keep that trajectory moving forward? Do I need to pick one of you, I'm, or do are you, I'm gonna uh, jump Gretchen, right in? Here you go. Because I'm I'm right. uh, I'm incredibly optimistic, and and I actually wouldn't be doing this kind of work with you, Paula, and you, Gregory, if I wasn't, because I think it's conversations like the one we are having right now that I'm hopeful cause people to be maybe a little more curious than they were before, um, go out and listen in a little bit of a different way than they were before. Certainly those are two things I've learned at being part of this energy transition is that being curious, listening, learning, it's all part of it. If there was a book on the shelf on how to do this, man, we would have pulled it out and started reading it already, but there isn't. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a very complex, problem to provide clean, affordable, and secure energy. Um, and there's a lot of different aspects to it, but I'm, I'm really optimistic that this, particularly this country, um, with all of its brain power and leadership and curiosity and excitement and energy, like, I just think we've got a huge opportunity to be, um, you know, to, to continue to take big steps forward. It's not going to be easy. Um, but I do think it's conversations like this that I am hopeful cause people to go out and do maybe a little bit more questioning, ask a little bit more questions or get in action in a little bit of a different way than maybe you've thought possible before. Cool. Thank you so much, Gretchen. Um, same question to you, Paula. Yeah, I mean, I would say I'm really optimistic. And I will tell you, listening to Gretchen's optimism <laughs> makes me more optimistic because she, listen, Gretchen is in a position where the rubber really meets the road. Like it just doesn't. If if we have leaders um, in these positions who are optimistic about this transition, that's actually a good thing, right? If we had leaders who were in these positions who were pushing against the transition, I would be worried. So I am optimistic about that. Um, but I think staying on track requires us to be resilient. Um, right. These are systems. We have an energy system that has been built over a century. We're not going to fix it in three years. We're not. Um, there's a, we tell you 2035 to 2050 for a reason. Um, and so I think part of it is for us not to be discouraged. Oftentimes we want to see change happen. If you're doing it because you want to see change happen, you want to see change happen fast. Um, and change is happening. You know, I think Gretchen would agree with me that in the 30 years that we've been working, we've seen a lot of change, a, a significant amount of change, um, and even a significant amount of change as it relates to this particular transition over the last five years. And so it is about right, staying resilient, being diligent, not giving up, doing your part, doing that thing that is yours to do. We can't solve all of the problems, even if they're connected but the one that we can focus on is ours. Um, and we each, you know, kind of get to make that choice. But at the end of the day, if, if we don't do it equitably, then we actually, I, I believe we will have failed. 
um, because I don't believe we're in a moment when you can actually leave somebody behind and everybody else do well. Like we're we're way past that now. Um, we're all going to succeed or fail together. Um, and in that, there's there's something good about that too. Well, and and I know that Jordan is chomping at the bit to jump in with the with the questions. I want to I want to throw one more thing out at you, uh, Gretchen. Um, Paul used a really interesting word, which is when timelines are elongated and we don't see change happen at the speed of, of Senate terms and the terms of congressmen, we get sort of discouraged. Um, what would you say to the audience out there to really help them not be discouraged as they move forward and see incremental change, not tectonic change? Well, I, I think, first of all, I think all the people out there can participate in this. And that's one of the things that's kind of cool about the energy transition is that it's not something happening out there um, or in Washington or with Paula's group or Gregory goes and makes films about it with some people we don't really know. Like it's happening to all of us every day. Um, and we're making choices every day about, um, you know, how we heat and cool our homes, about how we transportate, transport ourselves from point A to point B. Um, about how we engage in, um, in, in the political process, about how well we understand the choices that we have about energy, um, and how well we understand the people that live and work in and around our communities that we have an impact on just as being a citizen of, of a community or of a member of a community. And so I think um, I would just say, like, all of us have a role to play here, and you can kind of put turn your back on it and say I don't really want to but man we're gonna make it happen faster if everyone takes a step forward and says I really want to get involved because um there's all sorts of ways to get involved I love that so much thank you Gretchen thank you Paula uh Jordan I'm gonna turn it over to you and again this has been absolutely amazing yeah, certainly. I appreciate the turnout over here, Gregory. First question we have here from the audience is, how does a focus on energy justice play a part on the path to a low carbon economy? That's for the panel. I'll, I'll start, I guess. I mean, I, I would say, you know, just as I said earlier, this transition doesn't happen without all communities. It just, it doesn't. And so I think centering justice is actually energy justice or, or and those communities makes it more challenging. Um, but I also think that this is probably one of the few times where we're actually trying to do the hard part first mm -hmm. um, for change, because we typically, even with policy, we wanna do the, the easy stuff first, the low hanging fruit, those things, the early adopters. Um, and now we're saying that we actually have to start with the hardest communities first, um, which I think then will be, get us a much better rate of success. Um, because we're not paying catch up with folks who really don't have the means or the abilities, the information or the access to catch up to everybody else. Yeah, and, and I would build on that and just say, I think <clears throat> I think focusing on equity and justice up front will actually enable this to happen faster. It might make it more complicated. It will make it more complicated. Like it'll be more complicated to do it this way. Um, but I think if we wind up with only rich people can have access to solar and wind and poor people have to do, um, you know, something with ha more heavier emissions. Like what, what we haven't actually succeeded in the energy transition and climate change will still be happening. And so if, if we all agree that climate change is the biggest, if at least one of the biggest, if not the biggest challenge of our lifetime, um, we, we want everyone in this together because it will make it a much better transition. And I believe ultimately, although it puts more complexity in, it, it, it can enable it to happen faster. Great question. Great question. All right. And on that note, could you speak to anything that you're doing specifically at Shell or ASE to measure and monitor progress towards energy justice? So I'll, I'll start. We have at the Alliance a project that we're calling Energy 2040. Um, and it really, that Energy 2040 is what is the role of efficiency for a carbon-free um, community or world by 2040? And a big piece of that, um, that work is around equity 
um, and justice. And so just this year, in fact, we'll be kicking off a research project so that we can better measure, right? What is the impact that um, efficiency is going to have on equity? And that means like, what's the impact that efficiency can have in really lowering energy burden? Um, what is the impact that efficiency can have in really um, lowering energy poverty? Um, but that's so that's work that we're specifically starting um, this year. And we do it this way. We do the research first, um, and then we will start to advocate for policies that we think will further that position along. But first, we want to understand where we are and what kind of data we need to collect and understand what that data really means um, very specifically by ge geography, not just at a national level, but also at a very regional and local level. Um, and then we move into policy work after we've kind of done our research work. Yeah, and I would I would add to that, I think at the, in Shell, you know, certainly one of the things that's, it's not necessarily always super easy to measure, <laughs> um, but one of the things we are measuring is how much money we're spending every year with minority businesses. And we've set targets, we've set a target two years ago to double that spend by the end of this year. Um, and we're gonna achieve that. And I think, well, at the end of this year, we'll set another target um, beyond that. I think the other thing we're looking at is as we start to approve investments in new energy projects like hydrogen production or carbon capture or low carbon fuels, um, we're very much looking and frankly, in you know, nudged along by the Inflation Reduction Act and the Justice 40 program that Paula mentioned, um, we're looking at as we invest in, you know, Louisiana Gulf Coast communities, Texas Gulf Coast communities, how much of our investment goes towards lifting those communities up. Um, and so really looking at this as an everybody forward, um, moving everybody forward effort um, is something that we're, that we're taking great pains, I think, to try to measure. Now, I'll just go back to a theme you've heard me mention a few times. We're not going to get it all right every time. And so we're trying to make sure we keep our ears wide open so that as we can start to, as we continue to move forward, we're getting really good feedback from these communities that, hey, this isn't really working for us, <laughs> but this is really good. Can you do more of that? And so I think that's, um, that's really important to, to, for us to, you know, constantly be in learning mode. Very well. I appreciate that feedback. And this is kind of piggybacking on the, the last point you made there. Uh, question is, can the panel speak to any experience you have with educating the very people we are trying to bring along in the energy transformation? I found that my experience working at the state level on the education piece can be rather difficult. I mean, I'll, I'll take a stab at it, Gretchen. I think I would start with, um, this is going to sound snarky and I'm going to apologize in advance, but I don't mean it this way. Sometimes it matters who's doing the educating. Um, and so, you know, there's there's something that I really believe when you start doing community outreach and engagement, which is that people move at the speed of trust. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we talk about educating communities, part of it is like, what are we telling them? How are we sharing it with them? What is the forum and the medium? But a lot of times it's who's the person or entity who is actually doing the communicating. I um, mean, that... We want communities to assume um, that they're going to look at us as trusted advisors and, and you know, we're going to give them the best information, et cetera. Um, I always kind of um, compare it to um, the person who comes, if you live in a subdivision, it says no solicitation, and then somebody is always knocking on your door trying to sell something. And your immediate reaction is always kind of like, I don't know who you are. Why would I trust you? That's the same for these communities. And so we have to be thoughtful about our partnerships. Um, and not assume that because we're the utility or we're their state, we're the city, that people are automatically going to open up their doors to you and, and, and trust and believe everything you say. Um, we have an obligation to understand who are those trusted voices in communities and then partner with them to lead us um, along the way. Yeah, and, I, and I, I think that was a perfect answer. And, and I would just build on that as a company um, you know, we certainly take very seriously our role in the community, but we often will go out and look for partners that can help us explain that, um, you know, whether that's uh, local officials that, um, you know, we've built relationships with, or whether that's an academic institution um, that, you know, can speak in an impartial way 
Um, or even, I mean, the best solution, the best outcome is if we've got our employees that live and work there that can stand up and say, you know, I work here, my mother worked here, my grandfather worked here, and this is a company you can trust because of these four things. And while they're, you know, doing this kind of business, they want to move into a different kind of business, and that should be benefit this community because, you know, it's lower emissions, it's run more efficiently, um, it's creating more jobs. You know, we're transitioning traditional hydrocarbon jobs into new energy jobs, whatever the benefits might be. Um, I think it's important to have a wide variety of stakeholders that come together to, to help with that message. You know, and I'm going to um, jump in with a shameless plug. Here we go. Um, I will tell you that um, the rational middle, um, and especially when you think about the education at the federal and the state level, the great thing that the Rational Mode does, and you can go to rationalmode.com. Um, and by the way, either of you guys would have gotten a hat and a water bottle if you had mentioned this, but like, uh, but the uh, the Rational Middle is something that really sets a baseline and it really does bring those experts from all sides of the issue into one place and establishes that, that rule for that conversation that really does educate people in a sense, but it also activates them to come up with a solution, which is what the Rash Metal and, and certainly Paula and Gretchen are all about, who both have been in Rash Metal films. So um, I've proven my point right there. Yeah, and I, I would just plug a little bit more. Um, I think, you know, Gregory did this great film that you saw just a brief snippet of um, called The Just Transition, but there's um, a bunch of other films on rationalmiddle.com that talk about electrifying America that talk about um, the circular economy and really do it in a way that is, I think, kind of akin to the conversation we've had here, which is trying to come at this from a couple different directions um, and put all the facts on the table. And it doesn't necessarily draw conclusions like now go this way, um, mm -hmm. but it does at least open, certainly open my eyes and my mind to how we can engage in a different way and how sometimes unusual partners can come together for a really powerful outcome. I I'm gonna give you yes. I'm gonna give Gretchen now seven exclamation points. <laughs> yes. um, but at the end of the day, I think what you're talking about is that this is why we have to do it together. This is exactly exactly we don't know what we don't know, but we do know that there's a lot that we do not know. And so that's how you get here. All right. Well, I certainly appreciate y'all's thoughts on that. Last question here before Bill jumps back in and wraps us up. Considering that we have an election year next year, if there is a change in administration, how would this impact the very public-private partnerships we've been discussing, uh, of course, with a possible change in policy? Wow. Well, I, I mean, I'll start, Paula. <laughs> I think that's for you. <laughs> You've got a big grin on your face, so I'm looking forward <laughs> to your answer. But uh, <laughs> Um, you know, from from our perspective, we don't do business based on who's in the White House. We do business based on um, what we think um, the world needs, what we think our customers need, what we think is needed to combat climate change. Um, and all of that is how we create our business plan. And um, we are we will work and can, we have worked and will continue to work with whoever is in a policymaking uh, role. We will continue to advocate for policy that we think will, um, you know, benefit the clean, low emissions energy that we're after, um, but also energy that's affordable and secure and reliable, which today, frankly, oftentimes is our hydrocarbons. Um, and so we're we're agnostic to that. Um, and and while Really, you've heard me say very pleased with some of the recent policy that's going to actually incentivize some, I think, meaningful investment um, in the clean energy. Um, we're we're ready to work with uh, with anybody. This is too important to not. I just totally, you know, at the alliance, we 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 work on a bipartisan way. It's in our mission um, to be a bipartisan coalition, and so we focus on efficiency, no matter who's in charge, no matter what party's in charge. Um, our mission and our priorities do not change. Work with everybody. Well, I hate to jump in because I, I would really love to continue this along the lines you all just finished up on, which is the importance of people working together 
to achieve these goals. I mean, it's, this is not going to happen by, you know, individual efforts here and there. It's going to happen by joint effort and vision. And as you say, regardless of necessarily who's in government, but private, public, well-meaning people. And I think you all stressed in a really beautiful way, the optimism, the trust, the need for leadership, because we're not going to get to a you know, low carbon, zero co carbon world without all communities participating and their involvement in a just and equitable and inclusive fashion. So, you know, my thanks to you, Paula, Gretchen, and Gregory for moderating this discussion. So important. We will be posting this online on the Our Energy Policy website. We also have in the Our Energy Library on our site numerous materials for those of you that want to read more about the topic that we've been discussing today. Um, our thanks at OEP to all of our partners, particularly to Shell for co-hosting this event. Um, and we encourage all of you to participate in the way that um, Gretchen and Paula, I think so beautifully laid out because this is an effort that really requires the dedication of all of us. So I'd like to wish all of you a great week. It's Monday, we have a full week of um, progress ahead of us, optimistic. Um, and um, good work to be done. And uh, my thanks, and we welcome all of you to join us for our upcoming programs. Gretchen, Paul, Gregory, again, thank you. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks a lot.